can I ask you to hang on for a quick second before we uh, broadcast here? I'm on a silent hold screen. Give me give me 10 seconds. Count to 10 and uh, go ahead and redo that intro. Okay. We are, by the way, we are streaming um, this session. Um, so uh, you're all, I hope you're all prepared to be streaming on Twitch. Um, perhaps some of you have not streamed before. Um, but be interesting and exciting, and perhaps you will pick up an audience. Josh already has an audience. Josh has a bigger audience than anybody else in this room. Um, and he created it himself. It is not an audience he was handed or gifted or inherited or, um, or you know, I mean, I mean the, you know, it is hand you. Are we ready to go, Matt? We are all good. Okay, great. So we're streaming now. Our guest is uh, the monster professor himself, Josh Woods. If you are not already subscribed to the, um, the, the podcast on Apple iTunes, it's on YouTube, which is what is actually behind me. Um, I can let you hear it for just a moment here. Barely Babysitters. Um, it was originally uh, titled The Babysitter Murders, or that's at least what the pr production company wanted. And it would, I'm glad they didn't stick with that for several reasons. So that's one of my favorite episodes of The Monster Professor about uh, oh God, it's about Halloween no, 1978. One, although oh, okay. we're going to have to have a fist fight one day. We are going to have to have a fist fight because okay. in that podcast, Josh dissed uh the uh, texas chainsaw no i didn't no i didn't no i didn't you absolutely I just, did i i as a texas chainsaw massacre oh. uh defender well anyway we're we're gonna have the conversation because what i've realized is it's actually exactly the same conversation as the one we had about well i mean you know but it's exactly the same dichotomy or, or you know our comparison as between um, the Munsters uh, and the Adams family is that that the oh. that uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is actually properly understood as the working class version, like or I mean, you know, sort of lower working class version of Halloween, but seen from the point of view of the monsters. Oh. Right? Like, like we that. are not we, we are we... not meant to be in sympathy with the with the uh the hippies yeah yeah even though it was it was a hippie film like made by austin hippies of right what but, they but were no no, no. we are into yeah we are Texas, but we are you're right I mean, the, the true <laughs> point of view and i don't mean the camera point of view i mean the sort of attitudinal yeah. point of view is on leatherface right i mean yeah you yeah know, so and leatherface is a working guy leatherface is just a butcher yeah, right? I, mean, I mean the best best barbecue in Texas, right. according to part two. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, um, so so, but that's we well, well, put a pin in that because I really we really should do that episode. No, I agree. Uh, I think I think that would be a good Halloween episode, versus and it gives me a reason to rewatch Texas Chainsaw, uh, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Anyway, Josh is a graduate of our program. He has been exactly where you are now, wondering what the future holds realizing that for uh, working class people who graduate from SIUC, it holds uh, relatively little in the way of uh, conventional fame and fortune, that publication is very difficult to come by and that you have to make your own way in this world. And so he started doing so even while he was here. I will also say, um, and I hope you don't mind this revelation, Josh, that Josh encountered a great deal of resistance and maybe he'll talk about that a great deal of resistance to the work that he did um, while he was here that workshops were routinely brutal to him um, not when he was in my workshop because I would be routinely brutal to people who would accuse his work as, as one person said um, although this was in a class this was actually in another class that Judy Jordan had criticized your um, lawgiver story um, about, you know, how silly it was. And it was like from a Marvel action movie, the guy sliding across the ice. And so I 
I said, yeah, well, chopping yeah, I said, heads off I said that's if you're ignorant of, of right of the Norse Edison of uh, Snorri Sturluson. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, so, yeah, of course, if you, if you think the Marvel comic universe was invented in like 14th century Iceland or whatever, um, <laughs> you're exactly correct. Um, that in fact, he was, he was, uh, cadging from very ancient, um, work. Uh, one of the, one of the pleasures of Josh is that no matter what he does, you know, that there is a powerful, um, sort of uh, background to the stories that he's telling. I remember a group of people making fun of his character, whose name was Metatron. Uh, that they were they were very upset about Metatron because he sounded like he was from a a. Uh, you, they keep comparing you to an incredibly successful movie series and seem to think that's an insult. Um, yeah. But Metatron, you know, he's getting, Metatron sounds like he's one of the Autobots or whatever, right? You remember that? Yeah, yeah. They, yeah they said I mean, who's Metatron? Like, take a Anybody besides Josh, who is who is Metatron actually? In the Bible or something? Yeah. Well, in the Bible or something, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, he, he's a scribe angel. Um, you know, I mean, if there's an angel writers should know about, um, it is Metatron. Is that a fair description of Metatron, Josh? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, and 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 eventually, kind of went from mortal to divine being to climbing, I guess, the ladder of divinity so well that in some of the in some of the uh, Jewish mystic circles, he's kind of known as the second Yahweh or peers to Yahweh in in power. Uh, I think that's a, a rare group or a small group, but it is at least part of the Metatron. And one of the things you're going to be doing in the course of this semester um, is you're going to be choosing your own um, sort of myth world, right? Whether it be, you know, uh, you know, Norse myth or Greek myth or Roman myth or, you know, whatever you want to find, right? A, a real uh, myth world. And you're going to be writing fiction within that myth world, right? Or that partakes of that myth world. And when I say myth, right? Like I'm a Christian, but, but I mean, I call I mean, I would refer to it as the Christian myth. That's no, I, I'm not trying to, uh, to belittle anybody. In fact, my problem with religion and creative writing is that most of my students don't have any. And as a consequence of whatever sort, Right. And as a consequence, they don't really know very many good stories or when they do, they tend to be pale imitations of things that are in the Bible or something. And uh, um, but they don't have any real power because there's a lack of belief and and that kind of thing. So one of the great one of the things writers have to do is train themselves to believe nonsense so strongly that they can write about it as memory of real things rather than as a made up story. Um, well, so anyway, so I'm saying what I, what I, you know, what I said to Josh years and years ago. Um, so, but his, you know, you know, he, he's published books. He's published a, a novel called the black palace, which is one of the great horror novels. I think of the 21st century, um, he has published a book of stories called Oh Monstrous World, which comes, that phrase comes from the Bible or something, doesn't it, Josh? Um, no, it's, um, it's it Shakespeare. Off, off yeah, no, off I, 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 yeah. I was kidding. Yeah, okay. I was joshing, but All that's, right, but that's what people do, right? They, <laughs> they hear, you know, they hear like, uh, yay, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death and they go, oh yeah, the Lord's prayer. Like we, I've run across that. I've run across that in novels, television shows books, you know, and you're like, it's not the fucking Lord's Prayer. Like, what's wrong with you? Like, I don't care what that's you a weird, That'd be a weird prayer. <laughs> well, yes! Exactly. Jesus said from the from the mount, he said, when you pray to my God, pray this. Oh, yeah, though I walk through the valley of death and the shadow <laughs> of death. Yeah, that would be a really depressing sermon on the mount. That would be a very different sort of beatitudes. But we're having a conversation that almost no one on this call can understand. Um, because they were raised by, by very progressive parents. Their parents didn't want them to know this terrible, mysterious stuff from the deep, dead past. Yes, Catherine. 
my parents weren't very progressive. I just wanted to. to no, no, I'm, I'm just joshing anyway, Catherine. I make gross generalizations and I make them as, as insulting as possible because then people walk off in a huff and I don't have to put up with those people anymore, which is awesome. Like, I've never had anybody walk off in a huff from me where I thought, oh, damn, I don't get to talk to that person anymore. Um, so, uh, uh, so that's teaching that's styles the same after. By the way, <laughs> your teaching styles the same after all these years. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That, <laughs> no, I I don't change, man. I'm I am uh, I just I you know I just get fatter, but that's really it, and not even all that much fatter. Um. So, but uh, anyway, the monster professor is Josh's invention. It is as I say, if you're not already subscribed, you should be. You should also subscribe, by the way. Um, to um, a podcast called Saints and Witches, also by two graduates of uh, this program, because we'll be meeting with them next week. We're going to be talking to people who have built their own platforms, um, because that's really the primary theme of this workshop, is building your own platform, not depending on some editor or agent or marketing person to make things work for you. Um, because they're not going to. It's not going to happen. Um, so, anyway, so, but I don't need to say anything else except that Josh is a person you really should listen to. Because, as I say, he's been where you have been, um, and now he is well-published, well-recognized, has won uh, uh, significant awards for his work, is a tenured professor at Kaskaskia College, not too far from here. He's, in fact, a full professor now, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Full yeah. Josh, when did you make full professor, Josh? At what age? Oh, uh, 39? Yeah, I was 40. So I wondered, I wondered which of us, which of us got there first. But yeah. I, I was four. I was 40. I was, I was okay. A month so we, you know, we made full, we made full at the same time. We're both, we're, we're, we're such phenoms, Josh. What, what is it about us? Um, Fun. What's that? You, we did win. Yeah. We both, we both were winners. That's all there is to it. Okay. So this is a person you should listen to because he's not going to tell you anything well he may tell you untruths but they will be really interesting exciting untruths based on some deep dark cosmic secret he is an expert in monsters generally uh, particularly um, i would say uh, classical monsters but also hp lovecraft um, and uh, uh, so but he knows many many other things it's just monsters turned out to be really popular right josh I mean, you kind of went, you kind of go with what works. Is that a fair assessment? Um, no, <laughs> I say, I say I, I go with what I like and uh, it's cool. But I, I try to be honest about what things I really think are cool rather than chasing after what I think other people think is cool. Uh, because that's, and it, but I is that a fair definition of, of was... something working? Right, is that it, it pays off for you. You keep doing it yeah. because it you you know it rewards you aside from any sort of public acknowledgement, but that, that you you do it long enough, all of a sudden you find there is public acknowledgement, right? You've established a you know, you've established a background and a, a backlist of work and and that sort of thing. And you know, and so so it, because the fakery, right? When you try to guess what will interest other people, you end up nobody ends up keeping that up, right? Like, and another right. thing, how many people from your class you graduated in from here in two thousand nine? Two thousand nine. Okay, so you and I yeah. arrived at SIU at the same time. Okay, so yes. uh, two thousand and nine. How many people from your cadre, and it was a bigger class in those days. I don't remember how many people yeah. were in your class. Yeah, our first workshop was like twenty people. So. That's what I remember. Like I remember it was just they were hanging from the rafters, and I yeah. I tried to make them angry so that it would get down to twelve or so. But I don't you made them angry. <laughs> I know, I know, but, but they not stayed. angry enough to walk out. Like not angry enough to quit. No. I, I don't understand that. Like, why be angry and still hang around? You know what I mean? 
It's like, just go do something yeah. else. I mean, just tell me, like, hey, I hate you. <laughs> you probably hate me. What if I just didn't come and you still gave me an A? We could work. We could work that out. Um, like, it's a win-win, right? Um, so, but anyway, uh, um, how many of those people are still writing in any significant way? publishing or maybe they're in you know maybe they're in the publishing world or they've moved to movies or television or or whatever but besides you from the class of 2009 who is still a productive writer um, maybe lumens but i, I was going to say I maybe lumens doing... yeah when was the last maybe thing that. we read from lumens i haven't seen anything in a while i'm not sure yeah. I hate to be put on the spot because I love Lumens like that. But no, no, <laughs> I no, I, I love Lumens that. too. I, I, I yeah. you know, but I think he got caught up in the fake shit, right? And he started doing yeah. what he thought people would approve of. And he then he just lost interest in it. And he couldn't bear to do it. And he didn't do enough ever to get noticed. So, yeah. you know, being productive by rewarding yourself. And we talked about this last week. Anyway, my apologies, Josh. I just, I love talking to you. I love talking at you. I love talking with you. So, but I'm going to, I'm going to try to shut up now. Well, I mean, your, your point, I guess about, I guess about what kind of thing to do or what kind of thing to write. At one point, um, I just like made the strict conscious decision for my novel. I, I said, I have a feeling I know the kind of thing that could get agents, could get published, that could maybe get bought, or at least I felt like I knew stories well enough to do that, especially in the literary world, in the going the literary route. But I thought, truth is, you don't know if anything's actually going to ever work out, or if anybody's going to like it, or if you've, you've figured that you've hacked the formula well enough for them anyway. And... If it's all for naught, I want to have enjoyed it anyway. Like I want to write the book that the book I want to read, but no one else has written it. Uh, I want to write the thing that if it never gets published, all these i felt like i was in a room full of people who were who were writers right and i was i was just somebody trying to slide in with the fastest graduate degree i could 
to go get a job and and maybe not let anybody find out that I like writing stories about monsters or something and try to hide that if I can. Um, and then after a while, and it took me years to sort out, there's kind of a difference between being a writer and telling a story. And I think some of those, some of those students think you referred to that kind of just as soon as they got their degree kind of just faded off into the ether and have nothing to do with the world anymore. They wanted some time to be a writer. They liked being a writer. They liked the coffee shops and the, and the, and the, and the complaining about wine that wasn't French enough. And, <laughs> and they liked being at readings and stuff. And I think all that stuff is cool. Uh, they wanted to live in Wonder Boys, and and I did too at, at some point. But ultimately, that was just that uh, that didn't last very long for me. And and I think that kind of thing I'm I'm stereotyping quite broadly, but I think that kind of thing can even fall all the way down to the page level, where being a writer, uh, being a uh, being a writer versus telling a story is something like on the being a writer side is focusing on images, uh, focusing on irony, focusing on prose, on the great prose. Like what you want out of your story is something which the sentences sound are smooth or put together well or, or are pretty or precious. You want, you want these images that are either shocking or you want to have various ironies and then you call it done, like that's a story. That's not a story. <laughs> it's just being a writer, uh, and I think I think a lot of what I read from my fellow students was something like some pages in which they were being writers. Uh, I think great literature does all those things. I think great literature has good prose, good images, uh, a, a really beautiful play of ambiguity and irony. Um, Maybe I should say instead that that's just not how stories worked for me, and I think it could be helpful to think about stories in a different way. So maybe, so so where I'm going with this is something like I'd like to I'd like you to play around with thinking of story as a structure that is not the same thing as its content. Like what a story is about isn't the same as what the story is. And I, so I want us to think of structure versus content as two different things that can sometimes match up, but don't have to. And also maybe structure versus genre uh, as two different things. Genre is just a, a market segment or a genre is is either a tradition or something that marketers come up with. It's not the same as the structure of a story. Um, and so, so what what kind of structures are there to stories or, or what are these things? Well, I don't think you can ever get anybody to give you any two people to agree on a finite list. <laughs> I think everybody's gonna everybody's gonna come up with their own. And so so I think a cool way to play around with the idea is something like think back through stories that work and have worked and continue to work either across time or even across bad translations or bad versions of the thing. Even if you get a story and then there's a bad version of it and it's still pretty good, that means there's some there's some actual story structure in there. And then start taking out the content of the structure. If it happen, if it's something like, I don't know, if it's something like the Odyssey, it does the the um the the story of this king off to or chieftain off to war and then trying to get home and he has to undergo all this time and all these stress has to undergo a sea of troubles to get home to his wife and then once he's there he, he's got to set his house in order um, the that's kind of a summary of what the story is and it's so brief a summary that i've left out a lot though not all of the content uh, that's different from the structure the boats the ships the gods the goddesses the 
the the politics back in Ithaca uh, that he's even a chieftain that was at a war that is sailing home all of that stuff is content and that doesn't have to be there to tell the same to tell the same story um, and you could go well you know I don't like the Odyssey because I don't like ocean going stories or something like that well that would be confusing content with with structure or even confusing genre structure like well i don't like ancient myth stuff well, okay well that, or you know greek ethics okay that's the genre that it's in too sometimes those things match up but sometimes they don't um and so i have i have a way of of thinking through some of what i think are the most universal story structures or at least a couple of universal story structures um, I'll share some of those ideas with you, but but I think it's perhaps more important for you to start thinking through kind of what stories do you think are great stories, even if you stripped away the beautiful prose or the beautiful cinematography, even if you stripped away the content of those things, would that story still work? Now you could say, well, I'm a setting writer or I'm a character writer or something like that. I don't think you're just talking plot here, Wood. Okay, so know your strengths as well. <laughs> like if you can do setting, I'm jealous of you because I don't think I can do setting very well. If you can do character, I love you because I love good character writing. But there's no reason why you can't also kind of work out the bones of a story and then just wrap your content on top of it. And so you can abstract out, for instance, the story of some of somebody trying to get home and then setting his house in order kind of thing and, and then play it out with instead of, of a, you know, an ancient, a, a chieftain from antiquity coming back from the Trojan War to get rid of the suitors in Ithaca to save Penelope, then I don't know, you got, then you set it in 1985 and you try to get home in a DeLorean and set your house in order so so Biff doesn't ruin the future or something, right? <laughs> fix your parents rather than your wife, fix that you're still trying to get your house in order while you're trying to travel back to where you came from uh, through across a, a, a different kind of sea of troubles. Um, so, but I mean, that I think that kind of thing, it doesn't have to just be quest like you can start like if you're a huge fan of, I don't know, I just binged. I just binged Shit's Creek recently. I'm probably the last person to have seen that, but I Brilliant. but um, yeah, I, I thought well, at the first episode or so, I thought this is too hokey. But then I got I got over myself and got hooked. And I think I binged the whole thing like one week or something like that. But I mean, there's there's lots of different ways to to deconstruct that to see what's making that work as a as a story. I think as when screenwriting we call it the fish out of water comedy or something like that. But you could see it more in folktale, like city mouse, country mouse kind of thing. Like then think through how many city mouse, country mouse stories have you seen where you see a city person thrown in the rural life or a rural person showing up in the big city. It always works. Why does it, even when it's not good, it still works. Why is that? There's something to that structure. So what I'm saying is steal. <laughs> what I'm saying is take somebody else's story that is working and then just strip away the content of it and then just add your own. Tell City Mouse, Country Mouse in the middle of an intergalactic war or something like that. Tell, tell Shit's Creek but set in the Star Wars universe or something like that. I don't know. Like you could, you can create and just change all the names and then it's not the Star Wars universe or something. Um, so, so with all, I don't know, with all that said, I kind of feel like maybe the next step is to share with you how some of the, some of the story structures that kind of make sense to my, in my mind. But maybe I should just pause and take your questions and com and or comments about those ideas first. So we, you know. I have a question. Uh, so you are a horror writer. That's kind of like your genre, right? So how do you find 
uh, these big plot structures that come up in like the classics uh, arriving in horror, are they transferable or do you have to invent more? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And w believe it or not, I don't consider myself a horror writer, really. Although I've, 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 you know, even though I just, you know, all I seem to do is write about monsters <laughs> nonstop. So I can't really defend that very well. I'll defend it by saying, I think a good horror writer has to scare. <laughs> I don't think you have to, because I think horror structure is different from like horror content. But if I, if I were to put myself as a horror writer, I, I don't think I've ever written anything scary, to be honest, or I, I have never published anything scary. I've written scary stuff, but I just had never worked out. Anyway, uh, I'm avoiding your question. <laughs> your, your question is, is yeah, I, I think... I think there's something fundamental to horror stories that works well that you don't see as a story structure as often as you do see what I call quest structure in the ancient, in the ancient works, such as, you know, the, the Aeneid, the Odyssey, all sorts of stories have a very a quest like feature to them, or even, you know, Sigurd the Dragon Slayer, all sorts of them, but they still exist. But before I go into an example of some an ancient story that I think has horror structure, I I will say that there's there are still horrific elements that you can pull out of there and recast in your own way, or you can just reconceive of of what was going on in that structure. Like, like something I'm still trying to sort out. And since Pinkney brought up Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I'll slide this into there. I think there's a, there's a certain kind of quest that rather than getting to the top of the mountain, rather than going on the quest to defeat the, the dragon or whatever, rather than trying to get back home, it's just like, you think you're on a quest, but it's trespass into hell. And, and so you get trapped in the thing. And I think Texas Chainsaw Massacre is trespassed into hell um, when they think they're going on a fun adventure and they stumble into hell that they can never emerge from, except the final girl, but she's never going to be right after that being <laughs> Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But anyway, um, so, uh, so I think, but so, the, so the, why not take, for instance, I don't know why I'm on the Odyssey today, but it just got stuck in my head. So here, so why not take the Odyssey? But instead of getting back home to Ithaca, he gets through all of that and he just gets deeper and deeper into hell. Well, then aren't you playing with something like Heart of Darkness? I think so. I think if ever there was a, like a, a more, I don't think there's a more elegant mix of quest and horror that I say so often are opposites that kind of are shuffled together so well as something well, apocalypse like now. Heart of Darkness. Yeah, yeah, or Apocalypse Now, which, as you know, was John Milius's Heart of Darkness. Like, he wanted to make it, and it wasn't working, and it wasn't working, and he goes, oh, Vietnam. The setting, he was too stuck on setting, or he was too stuck on content for a while until he could zoom out and see, oh, the structure's the same. I don't... And it doesn't have, again, I should back up and say, this doesn't have to be one for one. I'm not asking you to write one for one allegories kind of thing. Like, like oh, oh, brother, where art thou? Had a guy with one eye. So that was the allegory for the Cyclops or something in the Odyssey. Like, I'm not asking you to do that. I, I, the, the great thing about stealing and stealing structure is, is uh, putting your, your own twist on it, but you're building on something that you know has already works and, and has already worked for storytelling generations upon generations. Um, but I will say uh, that I think I, uh, especially in the original J text, the earliest text that ended up being edited into what we now know as Genesis, but I think also still the, the current version of Genesis, I think the Garden of Eden story is a horror story. I think that's horror structure through and through and that's at least 750 years old as a document we know it's much much older than that or it's the oldest thing that there was because it was the first story i don't know depending on how you want to look at it so so it's it's either 750 or the oldest thing ever um or somewhere in between 
And that, and I think that really works. And part of the reason it's compelling is because, well, maybe I'm just, maybe, maybe I'll pause before I tell you what I think the four, st- the four pillars of horror structure are that make horror structure a- and open it back up to questions and comments, but very good question. Yeah. Um, I'm Jody, by the way. Um, I come from a little bit different background than everybody here, so it's my question is going to kind of come from that direction a little bit more. Um, I'm in the historical field. I have a performance background. I'm kind of this like um, you know jack of all trades of <laughs> trying to put a master's program together. Um, but because so much of even the stories that you just talked about, Genesis, the Odyssey, um, these were originally begun orally. They were transmitted orally. Um, as as the medium of storytelling has changed, because that's what I think of this class as, I mean, creative writing, I think of storytelling kind of first before I think of anything else. Um, again, having a different background. And so, you know, I'm not going to always approach it from... Um, the, the disciplines way of, of defining all of these things. How important as you write or do you think it is to be able to read something aloud and, and especially with podcasts and, and all of these different medium mediums coming forward that we're, that especially Pinkney is encouraging people to um, pursue. How important is that as opposed to it being on the written page is being able to, to listen to it, hear it, see it, and, and all of those other dimensions than other than just, you know, a typewriter or a computer or a pen and paper. Yeah, that that's a that's a good I like that. It's a really good pragmatic question too. Like should I <laughs> should I face the fact that I'm gonna have to do public readings or listen to recordings of myself if I want to continue. I never would have thought that that audio stuff would ever matter or that kind of stuff except maybe at readings hell when I first started my first creative writing class I was horrified to find out that we had to do a reading like of our work like I thought you just everybody just read silently I didn't know people stood up and read to each other anymore that sounds horrible to me I still don't really like it (laughs) to be honest with you Uh, but but who, who saw it coming I sure didn't in which which audio the audio medium is just uh, is well it's i guess ubiquitous i mean it's everywhere and i and it makes sense now in hindsight you can there's so many things that so many people have to do day in and day out that are so mundane that you doesn't demand all your attention like driving for instance or you know pretty much every forklift operator i know just listens to podcasts nonstop you know listening to audiobooks listen to uh, to to podcasts while you're driving it's so easy to get your stuff out there there are no they haven't really set up the gatekeepers well enough to stop any of us <laughs> who have no real pedigree from getting in there uh, and and doing these kinds of things like you could find my podcast beside actual broadcast professionals and that probably just infuriates them uh, but I, you know they'll find a way to put the gates up at some point I don't know it's just it's you don't have to do it there are ways around it right you don't have to be involved in that side of it but it makes it so easy to get into and to try it and i think there's it's it it shuffles together so well for what we do um and especially if you're wanting to like work out ideas far more people have heard my ideas in the some of the ideas that i have in podcasts than have ever read my publications in which i say those exact same things just because it's that much easier to get your stuff out there and it's a hell of a lot easier just to turn hit record and just say out the things than it is to like write it up well and get it published somewhere so it just makes it so easy also a lot of us have at least some experience 
teaching, which is a form of public speaking too. So we're not, we're not, uh, not all of us are, are completely inexperienced in sharing your ideas auditorily. So it's just, if you can find, if you can find it within yourself to give it a shot uh, and find ways to turn your stuff audio or to incorporate the audio, into it, I think everything's going to, it's just going to boost everything else you do. I don't, there are ways around it because I know some people just absolutely cannot stand the sound of their own voice or don't want to be involved in that kind of stuff. I don't think you have to, but man, oh man, does it make everything easier. Well, and there are good uh, AI voices now that you can just feed your text to and put in some emphatic marks and you'll end up with a perfectly acceptable human voice now. That's a great, that's a great point. Actually, half of the audio books that I listen to, I just have my Kindle use the robot voice and read yep. to me. Well, and, they, and there are and, way better uh, like voices than that. Yeah, and you could, you know, it'd be easy actually to set your work up so that dialogue is read by, you know, different, you know, different AI voices. You know, you can have a cast of dozens or hundreds if you use, if you use AI voices. Yeah, that's, that's a, that's a brilliant idea. Well, uh, we're, and, one of the things and, we're and doing point. with the, with the Neophyte project, with the Digital Humanities Lab is we're working with SIU Press. We're going to try to set up a system to bring a bunch of their backlist stuff uh, you know, back into print via audio by having it, you know, just having it read by AI voices rather than having to cast it. And, Whoa. Yeah. I didn't really know that. Fast. That's really cool. Yeah, well, it means we have yeah. hundreds of books to choose from, right? And all of a sudden they start, you know, these books start generating, you know, income, you know, for SIU Press. And so we become indispensable to this press, right? Um well, uh, let let me say though that the eleven students listening to that, if if you listen to that and you realize that you you have a professor who just is is kind of showing you that you can take your work and do that with AI and he can walk you through it, or you have a chance to like latch onto him as he does that thing, then the eleven of you are miles and miles ahead of everybody else in the nation or in the country or in in the world in any MFA program. Like that just gave you a huge advantage over everybody else out there who's trying to be a writer because no no other MFA program is doing that. And they all should be, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's weird, right? Like, I, I don't get it. Oh, uh, so, so maybe, so uh, I guess since I te since I tease talking about what horror structure is a little bit, maybe I should throw that out there and then and then throw out a couple of of ideas that you can play with for writing exercises, maybe. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Is why don't you do the the you know the horror structure thing? And then they can do a small version of it for the in-class writing exercise they're going to be doing in a few minutes. And then they can do, and then they can expand on that for their story time work for, uh, for streaming next week. Okay. Yeah, that sounds cool. Then, then, um, you know, as I was already referring to, uh, West and, and then I started describing this kind of thing, like, like, a like a young, it, it, I bet that was already familiar to a, a lot of you, like a young character kind of meets a mentor, is given some sort of gift, probably went through some difficulty in even being born or in childhood to get through the dangers and then and then is kind of guided by a mentor with some object, whether it's like a your father's sword or a ring of power or ruby slippers or whatever and then you set foot out the door of the ordinary world voluntarily or otherwise and then you go off in these adventures and you meet weird friends and you make weird enemies and you self-actualize and win and come back home and all that kind of stuff and that's and lots and lots of people have sorted that out probably joseph campbell most famously but other other people a little bit sharper i think um and that and i call that kind of thing quest and that for sure is universal but i think there's another kind of universal story that flips that on its head and I don't have a better word for it than horror. It does, I don't necessarily mean the horror genre, but I, I can't really come up with a better, I'm too stuck on that term to change it now. <laughs> so, and and I think it, 
it does everything, almost everything the opposite of that in many cool ways. It's these stories that I, I think are built on four pillars and, and I'm gonna call them seclusion, the other, descent, and doom. I call write them other those, things. Write the those down, by the way, because you're going to be consulting that list. What was the, the third one? I didn't quite catch it. A descent. Ah, okay. As in down, going down. Which is the name of a pretty so good horror think... movie, actually. The Descent. I still Have haven't seen, seen that. About the, That's on the my... No, it's, it's on my... It's on my list, but my list is about 300 now. I just, I'm doing, I never realized how little I knew about horror as a film genre until a recent year. And I just, I've been binging and I can't get enough, but I haven't got to that one yet, but I will. <laughs> okay, so so anyway, um, and I don't think these things have, to, I don't think these, the horror structure has to have anything to do with horror content. I don't think it has to be scary. I don't think it has to involve monsters or killers or anything that grotesque. And it still can have these four pillars. By seclusion, I mean isolating, isolating your characters away from other things in the world or apart from each other. So something something some version of uh, autophobia and claustrophobia like you're alone and cut off from the world or you, there's no way to really connect to other people and you're kind of or you're, you're kind of stuck in some way or there are there are boundaries to where the story can exist almost that thinking of the opposite of going out and traveling and journeying and voyaging is stuck somewhere by the other, I mean, there is something that is not quite right, whether that is the other as in a monster or as an other that's a person that's not the kind of person that that's what you are, that's what a person that's not what a person should be, or some other thing crosses that threshold from outside of the world or outside of your character's world a thing where it's locked off and it hasn't been it crosses the threshold and enters this other world and, and, and that's, that's and the other is not a judgment right or or that is it's not necessarily an accurate judgment it, uh, right i mean I, yeah. And I know. yeah yeah calling it the other as in like like yeah that yeah that's not a that's not a yeah moral judgment on the other thing at, at, at all it's it's what is that what you're saying like call right it exactly it's the, it's that the character considers the person other yeah right right exactly right like okay uh an example of that would be are, are you familiar with like raymond carver's cathedral right or this this kind of jerk of a guy is stuck at his own house one night while his wife's blind friend he's like a sensitive smart guy who's blind and it's freaking the main character the hell out because it's a blind guy and they're freaky and they're not right and they're and they're just creepy and he hates it but he's isolated right he's secl he's he's in seclusion and in that he has no other friends because he's a jerk that's his own fault he doesn't really have a job or not one he likes he's got nowhere else to go no other woman in the world would have him other than this very generous <laughs> lady so he's stuck in this house and then in comes the blind guy I don't think that Raymond Carver was saying blind people are evil or bad, <laughs> right? but, but I don't think, I don't know, but, uh, but, but to that main character, because of his own moral failings, his own uh, implications, uh, to him, he's seeing this thing as other, but it is other. Here's a guy who's very different from what he's used to. And then, and then you have what I call descent and doom. And one way or another, you take your characters and you're pulling them down and taking apart all that they had or that they thought they had, rather than the quest kind of builds a character up. They get stronger, smarter, more friends. They become more of themselves. When descent, you're kind of pulling away, like they're losing their friends. They're losing the things that they thought they had. They're losing the confidence that they thought they had. They're losing... There, maybe it's a moral descent, maybe it's physical descent that they're getting hurt and taken down, down. 
And somewhere along the way or across the whole thing is, is what I'm now calling doom. But really it's built this, I, I'm thinking of this idea of being built out of two things, like implication and inevitability. And the word doom actually kind of packs both of those in etymologically and otherwise, is that this thing is meant to happen and it always has been and it always shall be. And that's just the curse of humanity or the way the world works. But also it's like a judgment upon you as in like the, the main the, or the characters or humanity itself are the ones responsible for all this or responsible for something. They're implicated somehow in some way. And it doesn't have to be as, as far and as obvious as the, the classic horror reverse of like, oh no, we were hunting the monster when all along the monster was me or something, or was I. Like I created the monster, but who's the real monster? That guy. I mean, that that works too. Uh, but it can but it can also be something like, oh, the the way we are, the way we live out our lives is the thing that let the other cross the threshold, is the thing that brought us down, is the very reason for our own seclusion. And those stories function differently than a quest story. And I think short stories work well for that, to, built around those four pillars as opposed to a quest story. And I think the literary story quite often in many ways, it uses the good ones, use horror structure more than they do quests. I think maybe road trip stories will use quest structure more than horror stories. Uh, but, but uh, you know, novels uh, work much better, I think, with, or they're easier to write, I think, with something like a quest structure. Um, but I still think that there's immense storytelling power in what I'm calling this horror structure story built on seclusion, on dissent, on doom, and the other. However you interpret those kinds of things. You can interpret them supernaturally, they can be literal, or you can start playing with them more figuratively. I think too. So, so what are your thoughts on that? Or questions on that idea, or we can play with examples. Or did that make any damn sense at all? <laughs> I think it makes a lot, a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I mean, actually, now you start to think of the horror stories you've read. I haven't read that much horror. I, I would like to read more, and trying to think how it fits in. And for some reason, the one that always comes to mind is. We have always lived in the castle. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Beautiful. And, oh, and that's right. The other, who's the other? And we have always lived in the castle. It's kind of maybe like it's you've got the other in Mary Cat in a way, even well, though. Well, but but someone literally other invades their home. Well, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Right? The guy, the, the, the guy, yeah, the, the cousin, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, he yeah. is Dracula in that story, despite the fact that he's much more normal, normal yeah. than the, uh, than the protagonist or her sister. Um, but he, he comes in and he's the, you know, he's the other, and then everything begins to come apart. Yeah, yeah ab absolutely. So, uh, you know, and, and you've got, you know, the, the town is the other, and then especially cousin, I can't remember his name because anyway, yeah, he's the, he's absolutely the other, you know, and then they cross that threshold in, into their world. And why are they secluded? Well, it's because their own, their own kind of, their own implication, their own doom, but there was no getting away. They're physically secluded and talk about dissent by the end of the story. They're living in a burnt out, ruthless right, right. I mean, kind of gets, thing. Every, everything they had is... Worse, yeah. Or, or Joyce Carol Oates' uh, Where Are You Going, Where Have You Been, right? I mean, Arnold Friend is yes. the other. I mean, he's he's a monster. He's a, a vampire or something like that. I mean, not literally, right? But I mean, in horror story subject matter, yeah, um, he's the other who shows yep. up and lures her out of the house 
because she's fated to leave the house, because it is our nature to be attracted to our dinner. Right. And so so yeah. you, no one would ever describe where are you going, where have you been as a literal horror store story or a horror story in its subject matter. But clearly it is structurally a horror story. Yeah. Yeah. Or we can even get farther away from it because that's still involved like abduction and a kind of a gothic house and stuff and, and murder in the past. You can even take something like Bartleby. Right. And, and like Bar Bartleby doesn't involve murder. It doesn't involve monsters. It's not really gothic. It's a Wall Street story. Isn't that the subtitle a story of Wall Street? Uh, and yet you look at that. What's going on in that story? It's seclusion in this office. Bartleby is the other. He lacks soul. He lacks a human soul or something like that. He lacks proper speech. All he can say is just over and over. I'd prefer not to. And bit by bit, it tears apart this main character's life until he realizes, oh, we're the ones who made Bartleby like this. Right, Our right. Yeah. Well, well, what's the, let's see if anybody in the class, system. how does that story end? What is the final line of Bartleby the Scrivener? I'll give you the first half of it. I'll give you the first word. The first word is O. Oh. Oh, my gracious. How many of you were English majors in college? Yeah, um, I, 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 you know, the, 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 the whole not learning anything is weird to me. I don't know where, where that came from, but okay. So, so Josh, do you want, do you want to tell them? Cause it's so I'll, a perfect I'll, illustration. I'll jump on the I'll jump on the grenade. The last, the last four words of that story are, Oh, Bartleby, ah, oh, humanity, <laughs> right? Right, like, so Bartleby about... is humanity, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, oh, you know, it's like, oh, the humanity when the, you know, when the the, the Zeppelin blows up, right? I mean, it's a, it's the, the perfect equation uh, of, of, those, of those two things. Yeah, and so that's, you know, and then, so that's doom. So the, the story is built on those same four pillars. And, and that's, and that's a story that I don't think anybody would call like, well, that's not a horror, that, that's not a horror story that wouldn't sell well, I don't think among horror fans. I don't yeah, you, would, you wouldn't put it would in put a stamp the year's on best, the year's best yeah. horror story so, or anything like no, that. No, no. But it's horror structure. And I, and I think that's why it works. Right. And same, same thing with Cathedral, right? I mean, is it, you yeah, know, and that's yeah. that's the well-made story. You know, I mean, Gordon Lish uh, would, you know, who was who was Carver's editor would die before being a so. Well, luckily he's dead, but he would <laughs> die before being associated with genre writing, right? Um, but it's a horror story. <laughs> um, yeah, and so ma and so many other. I think so many other um, stories do that as well. Well, and so so the important. I mean, the important takeaway, I'll outline what's important about what Josh just said. Uh, the important takeaway is everything Josh just said. But I mean, the, the, but one of the things I want you to spend this semester doing, and it's very hard for writers to do, I think, and young writers, old writers, is separate yourself and your judgments from subject matter, right? Don't, don't worry. Like, I'm going to you know, talk a lot about action, right? And everybody, all literary people get upset and they're like, he wants us to write gunfights. Well, yeah, actually I do. And I may require you to write a gunfight because you can't be an American without writing at least one gunfight, right? And even if you're not American, you got to write a gunfight because we, otherwise we won't believe you. Um, Cause we're, that's, that's, that's just who we are, man. Um, so, but, but it, so I'm not talking about gunfights, right? I'm just talking about something happening. I don't care whether it is. It can be entirely in the head of the character. It can be entirely pedestrian if you want it to be. I don't know why you'd want it to be. Um, but, but divorce yourself. Understand that structure and subject matter are not the same thing, right? And that many of the examples I'll be using of things have exciting subject matter. And I know that's anathema to many of you. But you can just substitute dull subject matter for the exciting subject matter, and you'll have your own literary story. 
right? And that'll be great, I guess. I mean, but it'll at least be a story, right? It won't just be a bunch of literary crap that nobody wants to read. Like, stories satisfy structurally no matter what their subject matter is. It's why you can like stories you don't care about the subject matter of, right? Um, yeah, it's like, who, who cares about anything, any of the people that, that you know, Carver was writing about, right? Um, who, who cares? Uh, you know, but what you care about is you have the experience of the story. It feels like a story. Um, and so we'll be talking about folk tales, but I'm not telling you to write about people who live in the Black Forest, right? I mean, I, I don't, you know, I'm just saying folk tale as a structure the brain understands. Because I think what Josh is talking about is not a manufactured thing. I think it's how the human brain works, right? Like what you, the reason it works is because your brain is meant to trip certain like, like little chemical wires and you do it and it gives you an experience that feels whole and complete, right? And it'll do it when you write too, right? Like the, the act of completing a scene, and we're going to talk about scene structure, but the act of completing a scene you know to be a scene will make you feel good, right? Even if it's not a particularly great scene, just going like, oh, that's actually a scene. That's a real thing. It's a, right, that just, it just changes your relationship to writing, right? Which I gather, I mean, and I remember this, I hated graduate school, by the way. Like, I'm not telling you, oh, be like I was in graduate school. I hated it. I hated the people around me. I hated Iowa. I hated the, I hated central time, like, I felt disconnected the whole time because real time was in West Virginia, right? And I'm like, I'm like, oh, this is weird. Like, I should be in bed by now. <laughs> uh, but, but, right? So don't be like me in graduate school. Um, but, uh, uh, um, but, but just, uh, 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 um, you know, give yourself those little pleasures that keep you working because that's that I maintain is the difference between a Josh right, who has the job we all want, who has the publishing life we all want, who has the podcast we all wish we had, right? And, you know, all the people who condescended to Josh, yeah, and made fun of Josh and gave Josh a hard time and occasionally challenged Josh to fights, which is crazy because Josh will beat the hell out of him. I, no, nobody took that. I got challenged three times and nobody showed up. Yeah, and, <laughs> and they're really each glad each they times. didn't. Josh is a, <laughs> a Muay Thai uh, uh, guy and uh, trained by one of the Gracies, am I correct? Yeah, Hoyt uh, spent a little bit of time training with him, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you've trained with Hoyt Gracie, right, other people should really not. And when the one guy worried he would freak out on you because of his army training, you know, or something <laughs> like that, and he was like a clerk. <laughs> Like he was just some kind of, he was like a, some, some kitchen patrol guy. Anyway, yeah. um, just, you know, the, those people have disappeared because they didn't like this very much. I mean, they didn't like the real thing very much because they did it in an incredibly painful and boring way. And their work came out incredibly painful and boring. Josh's work, if you will read it, reads like the work of someone who is taking pleasure in what he's creating. Right. And that's that in itself will lend a kind of glamour to your work that almost nothing produced in an MFA program ever has. Right. Because it's just I mean, first of all, MFAs try to write like like old people, which is weird to me. Right. I mean, I'm like, wow, like I'm actually old and I don't feel as old as the person who wrote this story. It's like, well, you know, I've reached the end of my life. and Nothing good's ever going to happen again. I'm like. Holy shit, like, why would I read that? Like, it just feels like autobiography. So anyway, all right, well, Josh, I know we need to let you go. Um, can we uh, say that the exercise that they now need to undertake, the in-class writing exercise that they now need to undertake, should they, should they, like, come up with a, what, 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 how, what's a good way to encapsulate this in a 15-minute writing session? that they can then build on over the over the coming week? Well, I, I think maybe two paths and maybe one sounds better to you or maybe 
you're willing to give them the choice of two like maybe one is kind of just like summer like a brainstorm a story that could work with those four okay uh, horror pillars or maybe another one if you like the idea of doing that kind of thing yourself is take a story i don't know like festus and the minotaur and just abstract it out without its content what's going on there and then maybe brainstorm a way to to tell a totally different story with those same bones okay uh, great. i gave yeah, you I love bones the brain for horror structure or, yeah. let's go let's go with that yeah. particularly that because that'll give them something they can they can you know then pursue over the coming week okay cool okay yeah cool well thank you josh uh as always i i'm sorry i took up so much time but I, I, I just I enjoy our exchanges so much, um, and I, I, I get a great deal from them. Um, I really do, too. I really appreciate you having me, uh, and I always, always love being invited and getting to spend time with you. And so I hope I, I, hope I was useful in some way, and so and thank you again. Yeah, well, will you come back later in the semester, maybe? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Great, we'll good, do. very good. And let's do that, uh, let's do the... Uh, Halloween Chainsaw Massacre face off. Absolutely. We got to. That's going to be a blast. Yeah, I heard you so, mention that I will... in the uh in the podcast. I assumed I was the person yeah. you were talking about in the podcast. Yeah. I've been in trouble I've been in trouble not just with you, but uh it, it ever a, since then. It was then. a bad so... call. Like I like your judgment. I admire you. I think you're a smart guy. I think you're a tough guy, but it, that was a fuck up. Like that was that was probably the biggest fuck up of our friendship. And I, so I just I, so I think I, I think my plan is to is to have you beat me up publicly and maybe that'll clear that you're <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's clear. Like I don't I don't I don't carry a grudge, but <laughs> I have to say I was uh, I was in high dudgeon, Josh. You, and you should have you should have seen it. I mean my dudgeon was like this high. As opposed to my general dudgeon level of like that. All right, man. Always fun to see you. All right. Great talking to you again. Thanks again. See ya. Bye. Okay. Well, so there, uh, and Matt, you can, uh, you can shut down the, the, uh, uh, the stream. Um, I, uh, uh, and, uh, but everyone wave goodbye. What's that? Everyone wave goodbye. Wave goodbye to our streaming fans. Bye, come back soon. We'll actually be back on in just a little bit because uh, folks are going to do story time for you. Um, so, um, okay.